Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Today's Teenager, a podcast that helps you to understand, reach, and influence the teens in your life. I'm your host, Roy Pettifees, and today I am super stoked, and I must say I am a little bit uh, starstruck um, and very privileged to have with me the best-selling author, uh, Miss Deborah Fine, um, who has written two best-selling books, one of which is The Fine Art of Small Talk, which has been published and widely read across the world. It's received critical acclaim from the Denver Post and the Boston Globe and the New York Times. Um, the subject of our discussion today was uh, her, is going to be her 2014 book that she released called Beyond Texting, um, Teaching Teenagers the Art of Small Talk and Making Communication. And for those of you who follow me, and I know that's a number of you, you know how, how passionate I am about small talk for teens because of the anxiety epidemic today. And as a clinician, I see so many of the young people um, who experience anxiety and they eventually tell me it's because they don't know how to start a conversation. They don't know how to keep a conversation going. And as Deborah's gonna hopefully talk about with us today, they also don't know how to exit a conversation. So whether you are an adult or whether you have teens in your life, I think we're all gonna get something out of our broadcast today. So first, let me welcome Deborah. Deborah, thanks so much for being with us. Roy, it's my pleasure. I'm really delighted. Not just because of the topic, but and me, it's because it's not all about me. It's about you, actually, Roy, and all the work that you do with teens. Oh. It's such a, a needed, always it has been, obviously. I've raised children myself. I was a teenager, and we need more people like you to dedicate themselves to really understanding, walking in the shoes of teenagers. And instead of just being like a dinosaur and telling young people how it should be. Right. And what I appreciate about you the most is that you respect teenagers. Oh, well, thank you. And and it, that was clear to me. And just reading that, if you just it would only read the table of contents of the Beyond Texting book, the book was written for teens and it's been it's been um, taste tested and teen approved. <laughs> And I wouldn't be, you know, because my teens are ruthlessly honest with me. And so I recommend the book and they will tell me if it if it sucks or not and if it's right. helpful or not. But they loved how the chapters were structured. So what prompted you like you already had this, you know, just book that was just lighting up the New York Times bestseller list, you know, the fine art of small talk. What prompted you to go from that and move into the 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 teens? Well, I'm. Um more, more than anything, I think, I think because I had found success in my business, I, I was always drawn back to the struggles I'd had as, as a teenager. And I think it's obvious anybody that can see me now that we did not have this kind of technology when I was a teenager. So I really wrote the book out of a passion. You know, I would have liked to write the book a long time ago, but I needed to earn money. And I was concerned that, you know, I, I you know, I needed to write to that other audience. But once I felt like I had the time to really focus. It was just came from the heart because I had struggled. I was very shy. I happened to be very overweight as a teenager. I don't think things have changed. Forget devices for a second. I think when you're really overweight, you're excluded from a lot of things. Um, get invited to parties. It's hard. To, it's I really believe that it's still harder to make friends. I mean, it's harder to make friends due to a lot of challenges in people's personal lives. And so I've always wanted to write a book for uh, teens on how to make friends and how to interact with adults in a better way, just because I struggled so much. I think I was on the cusp of realizing without being a scientist or a researcher that it, that devices just make it even more challenging to communicate face to face because we have a crutch. And I include myself in this, by the way, and, and, and you too, Roy, every generation, it has become a crutch, our devices. Um, when, when, when we're interacting with people and or just as a crutch so we don't have to talk to people. We look busy because we're using our devices. So I think this is widespread. I don't think it's just teenagers. I just think it's just harder to be a teenager today. And it was hard enough when I was one. So let's yeah. try to make it a little bit easier. Yeah, no question. No question. And so what, like for parents and, you know, we've got lots of educators, parents um, and youth ministers and lots of adults who care about teenagers who would be like, man, what a great idea. I'd love to teach teens. So where would they start? Where do you recommend they start in, in helping young people um, learn some of the, the basics in terms of small talk? Well, I think the the key is if you're if you're a parent and or educator and or youth minister, whatever it may be, they need to see you 
put good communication skills out there, obviously. And, and, you know, everybody that's listening, viewing this now, and we'll view this later, can cite in their mind just in the past week the occasions that they've witnessed adults in, uh, looking at their phones at a dining table. I mean, it's just, it's, or yeah. at Costco, it's just ridiculous. So, so that's number one. Number two, how to get started is to number one, Describe why this is so meaningful, why it's important. Well, it's important to get a job for an interview, to have these face-to-face -face skills. It's important to be able to interact with um, your teachers, uh, to go on college interviews, if that's the direction your life is going to take you, and to make friends. But I, I actually, I I'm not positive of this, but I'm pretty sure that the number one motivator for teens is still going to be making friends and fitting in. I think, I mean, you yeah. know more about that yeah. than I do. And I would just say, Give, give a motivation before you tell them how to do something and then say, this is how, you know, these are some tools in this book or tools, forget the book for a second. Just here are tools for face-to-face -face interaction, everything from body language to starting a conversation. You mentioned exiting a conversation, right? But also just how to carry yourself with confidence yeah. um, so that you exude that kind of person that you want to present out to the world. That, you know, that is the real key to be self-aware of what what you're putting out there to the world with your communication skills. Yeah. And 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 teens, you know, one of the and I love that you cover this in the book as well. You know, we always grow in self-awareness throughout our lives. And that's it's a huge um, learning curve as for teenagers to grow and to see how do I show up in my life? You know, how am I showing up? How do the people in my life see me? And very often they, they don't see that. And um, that it, and I love the point that you just made that it begins in the mind first, right? And so before it gets into the behavior, it's a mental, it's a mental attitude oh, yeah. that. It is, I mean, think about this. Anybody that's viewing this that is not a teenager, how difficult or how easy is it for you to walk into a party? It could be a baby shower, it could be, or church after right. service. Any, any event like that, are you the kind of person that walks up to new people and is inclusive and starts conversations with them and welcomes them to church and asks them either how they found the church, how many times they visited, what they enjoyed the most about the, the minister's words today, anything like that? Do you do that? But are you asking your teen to do something that you're unwilling to do yourself? Do you know your neighbors? Whether you live in multifamily housing or whether you live in a single family home, do you know them? When you go to back to school night with your teen, do you talk to the teachers about things besides how's Johnny doing? Do you ask the, the, the teacher, how was your summer? And really mean it and find uh, tools to really engage that teacher so you develop sort of this partnership with your teen. Are you showing those skills yourself? Or are you sitting at home at the end of your day on your, on your device and or watching whatever, you know, Netflix, whatever? Are you having real conversations and, and, and modeling that at home or are educators doing the same thing? You know, are they mm -hmm. things like, you know, t tell me about this project. Oh, it's okay. So what are you enjoying the most about it? What, what's the greatest challenge, Johnny? Um, how can I help? You know, to really have real conversations with teenagers would be a really great thing for all of us to do. Yeah, no question. W without question. And so I love this point. It's so, it's so many things with teenagers is that we're modeling. They are, they're constantly watching us, even though they don't give us the verbal feedback that they're watching us and learning from us. And very often they're not even aware of it, but they are, they're learning from us. And, you know, I was an awkward teenager and like you, I was a way overweight as a teenager. And really I, wow. what's that? I'm surprised. That's interesting to know that about me. I was, I was. And, I learned by watching and there was a there just so happened to be a Catholic priest who um, was a, just a social skill ninja, I would say. And uh, I, I learned a good bit from him. Let's um, talk about what you just did, Roy. I mean, if you don't mind, it's a conversational technique. And I don't think you did that for that purpose at all. I just want to throw this out. When you use self-disclosure with um, a younger person or anybody for that matter, but with a teenager, so Roy just disclosed that he was really overweight as a child. If you were disclosed to a child that you were shy or that you weren't shy, uh, but that you had um, a misunderstanding, let's say, or difficult conversations, if you can disclose anything about yourself when you're interacting with a teenager, you'd be surprised at what they're willing to disclose to you. I mean, the same thing holds 
true, Roy. Look what just happened. When I disclosed that I've been really overweight, you chose to bring that up as well. We model each other. So if I were to tell, um, let's say I'm, I, this is true about me. If I were with a teen on a chairlift, I live in Colorado, and I said to the teen, you know, I'm terrified of heights, which I am terrified of heights. That may not give him, maybe he's not terrified of, at a height, of heights at all, but once I give a self-disclosure type statement about myself, I become more human to a teen, less threatening, less um, in your face telling you what to do. I'm a human being is afraid of heights. Or I could say to a teen or anyone else, gosh, I had a great summer, I went on a cycling trip. When, when you disclose that you are into cycling, even if the kid's not into cycling, that gives him or her permission to talk about personal things in their lives too. But if all you are is an FBI agent with a teen, or by the way, any a person that's an adult, and I say things like, so Roy, what do you do? So Roy, well, let's play along here. Roy, what do you do? I'm a counselor. Counselor, and Roy, where are you from? Generette. Generette? Is that, where is that, Roy? In Louisiana. Louisiana, sorry. So what you've witnessed, all of the audience, is an FBI agent at work. So when we do that with fellow uh, colleagues or at networking events, that's not such a good thing. But do it with a teen, and you are you you're just you are FBI agent city. So hey, how about we stop interviewing our teens when we? How was school? Good. Um, what'd you do today? Nothing. Well, great talking to you. You know, I, I, you know. Uh, do you have a lot of homework? No. Well, great talking to you, and that's the end of the conversation. Instead, right. show them how to converse, but also use self-disclosure. If you can use it about anything, it doesn't have to be something that personal that you were overweight. It can be something like, "Gosh, I had a you know a good day at work. I had this project that's been overdue, and I got it done." Wow. You mean you have projects that are overdue? Wow. Yeah, I never thought right. of a teacher that that. It, it, remember when you were young and you would run into a teacher at the grocery store and you thought, oh, I didn't know that she was a human being. I mean, I distinctly remember that. You become a human being when you're willing to disclose things about yourself. That's right. And vulnerability, um, which is so key. And um, I love that. I absolutely love that. And I think a lot of a lot of parents feel as though they can't do that because they lose they lose their role as an adult. Um, when the opposite happens, you become more human um, to the other right. person. Right. I mean, and you know more about that than I do, but I, I, I know that I can sit down at a table of eight for a luncheon and say, instead of asking a question, which I would also do, show an interest in others, that's a key ingredient to success in conversation, but to also, when you use a disclosure statement, if I sit down and go, wow, it's been a crazy day, I um I I I am I could I couldn't get to the gym today, but you know hopefully I'll I'll, I'll watch what I eat at lunch. Oh, oh, you work out? I mean that I've I've just I've brought up a a conversation topic for the day. Disclose something about yourself and then you know throw that conversation ball out there and then show an interest in others so that the ball goes back and forth. What what advice would you give to teens or how would we let them know there's a difference between the different conversation balls, right? So right. a teen, so one teen could do that and it would go plop and another right. teen would do it and it would start a, a tennis match. Right. Well, I think the one, the key ingredient for any teen or any anybody else that's listening for themselves is that there is no perfect way to start a conversation. Roy, if you're busy. Uh, with some kind of agenda and I walk up to you after services and you see somebody else in the room that you need to get to, there's no way I'm going to be able to engage you in conversation. As polite and kind as you seem, I say, so Roy, how have you been? And you'll probably say, I've been great, Deborah. How about you? Great. And then you sort of will quickly exit because you see this other person. Well, the same, the teen needs to know that if he sits down at the baseball on the bench you know, the first day of the team, he has, he meets the coach, he sits down, they're all sitting down waiting to line up to, to hit, you know, it's their, gonna be their turn to hit. It's up to him to turn to the fellow on the right or the left and say, hey, um, how long have you, you know, how long have you played baseball? Or I, I noticed that I've never seen you on this team before, where are you from? It's up to you to start that conversation. Now here's the worst thing that can happen. That that fellow next to you says, why do you, wh why do you wanna know? I mean, that would be pretty rough, right? But it could happen. Yep. It could happen. This is what you need to know when somebody says, why do you want to know? They got a problem, you know, or they don't want to talk. It's not you they don't want to talk to. They don't want to talk to anybody. 
that whatever their problem is, it's not your problem. It's up to us to start conversations with people. And if they reject us to know it wasn't how we started the conversation. It was mm. they that decided they didn't want to talk to us. Maybe they're busy. Maybe they're nervous. Maybe they're not good at hitting the ball and they're up next. I, you know, who knows what's, what's going on for them. And I always say, try again with somebody else. You know, the ratios are with you. Maybe you'll strike the, the pot of gold every three times. That's what I do. And the best way to learn how to do this is to practice. It's like anything else. If I tell myself, I'm going to start a conversation with three new young people at school a week, three times a week, I'm going to start with somebody new or somebody I've met, but I haven't really talked to. Make that a task. When you turn it into a task, it's a lot easier. Then once you've met that goal, three people, whether it went well for you or if only one went well or three went well, you're done for the week. Now you can just hang out with the people you already know and or go read a book, you know, or go play video games or whatever it is you like to do. So turn it into a task. I'm going to meet one new person at church today and your opening line is going to be, you didn't ask, but I'm going to give it to you, Roy. The opening line should be based on free information. If you're at church, how are you connected to this church? You know, are you a member? Do you attend uh, Sunday school here? Are you, you know, what are you involved with here at this church? It, it, if you're at school, uh, tell, t- tell me what you think of this class. Um, uh, what do you know about this teacher? Uh, that's the free information we have. We're sitting in the same classroom. Uh, we have the same teacher. What, do you, what have you heard about this teacher? What have you heard about the level of homework? You start the conversation based on free information. If you're on a cross country team, you say to the, the young woman next to you, um, you know, what's the, the longest you've ever run? Um, how do you train? You know, what do you like to eat that really helps you get through a 5K? That's what you ask her. If she rejects you, it's not how you opened it. It's the fact that she chose not to be engaged that day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so many often you point you made such great points here. Uh, I love start the conversation based on free information. What a great right. what a great skill, as well as the, you know, don't internalize the rejection, which it's so easy to do in that insecure period of adolescence. And and I would say it's easy to do in my insecure period right. of 45. <laughs> I, that's right, Roy. And I think if we ever had a chance to have conversations with when I have conversations with teens, when I present to teens, but I always I try to be really clear about who I am and that what I do is I make a living teaching people that are my age and maybe some younger, some older who work for Google, who work for General Electric, who work for law firms. I teach them how to walk into a room and network or engage people in face to face conversation and or develop rapport with business colleagues. The reason I get to do that is because they don't know how to do it either. They're all looking for the perfect line. They don't know what to say in a room full of people that they don't know. They, they're smart. They went to law school. They, they got great SAT scores, but they just can't bring in billable hours because they don't know how to do this. So if they don't know how to do it, stop feeling, let's stop feeling bad about ourselves. Let's just learn the skills to do it. And that was the other point of this book is instead of telling what, what I feel was told to me, this is what you should do. Why aren't you doing this? How come you don't have friends? What? Tell me just how to do it. Tell me what to say. That would help me a lot. That's how I felt about it when I was a teenager. And that's what this book is about. Just tell me what to do. Tell me what to say. Don't tell me what I should do. It's it's maddening, actually, to be told what you should do without being given the skills to do it. It is. It is. And is, and that's that's why I fell in love with the book. And oh, my expectation going into the book a few years ago when I got it was that it was going to be a lot of lofty theory without um, without a lot of teeth. That, right. that gives them the practical, like the actual language to right. engage in that. And that's, um, and there's, yeah. there's illustrations of body language just, uh, that are negative and that are positive because, yeah. you know, everybody listening right now, including you, Roy, who's with me, picture in your head, someone at a party, an adult, forget the teen, an adult person, my age, as old as me. Have you seen a person as old as me standing at a party that's sort of fidgeting and, <sighs> looks uncomfortable, ill at ease. Do you think they do that on purpose? Nobody puts that out there on purpose. It's because they're unaware of their body language. So if somebody my age is unaware of their body language, isn't it possible that people that are 15 are unaware of their body language? So let's talk about what are you putting out there? Be aware of your body language. What is body language, right? You know, even other little things that I think are so helpful, especially to shy people, because I I was a shy person. Mm -hmm. I used to think, Roy, that people like, not you necessarily, but people around me were, they just 
they just talked. They just all talked. And at least I was a good listener because I was quiet and I was respectful and I just listened. But a good listener doesn't just sit silently saying nothing. I thought that was the case. And I pat myself on the back all the time. And I'm going to say to any teenager that you recognize that you must contribute at some level to a conversation when you're listening so that people know you're really listening. So here's an example. Give verbal cues. Verbal cues are I hope I've done it with you today, even though we're virtual, it makes it even harder. Really? Uh Uh-huh. Oh, okay, Roy. Yeah, that sounds good. Good for you. Oh, so what do you mean by that, Roy? Well, well, you know, what happened first, Roy? Well, what happened next, Roy? Well, we'll give you an example of what you mean by that. Those are verbal cues to let you know I'm following along, but letting you talk and encouraging you to keep talking, but you know I'm following along in the conversation. You've done it with me, Roy. You nod. That's that's a that is a visual cue that you're listening. You have been nodding at me throughout this conversation. That indicates keep going, Deborah. Keep talking. I'm following along in the conversation. You're giving me eye contact as only a computers can do, but you are giving me eye contact. I'm yeah. struggling actually because I keep looking at myself, the vanity in me, instead of looking at you because eye contact is critical. And that's another visual cue to being a good listener. So be aware of some of those cues. Those cues, of course, are in the book, but. Those are cues that any teen can do. You don't have to, if you're unwilling to start a conversation with a stranger, at least be an active listener where people know you're actually listening to them by doing those, those things I just itemized. Right. So uh, I love it. And the book is, is packed with gems and, and folks look, this isn't about promoting the book. Like as somebody who's written a few, I know Deborah's written, we don't make money from books. No, 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 <laughs> that no, is a no. Great myth. If you're looking to make money, you're yeah, not going right. to get it from the, the publisher. Right. So it's just, but it's a, it's a great resource. And, and you know me, I wouldn't be plugging it if I didn't believe right. in it and I didn't use it. Thank the, um, but, and I know your time's precious and I want to, but could you just say a little bit about the exit strategies, which you I bet. just think is so brilliant. I'm glad to. So, so ways I, I'm guessing teens do this as often as adults, the best way we know to get away from people. And it's a good way is to say, I need, um, I need to, um, I need to go, uh, go back. I've got some homework to do. <coughs> Excuse me. I need to, I need to get out of here. Um, I've got some stuff. I need to get to the library. I need to go get some, uh, some water. I'm really thirsty. Okay. So this is where we drop the ball on that. And then I'll give you another way to lead people. That's I think a sol- certainly a solid, but another, an alternative. This is where we drop the ball when we say I need. So, so I say to you, Roy, I need to, I need to go get some water. I'm, I'm thirsty. And on my way to get to the water fountain, you see the water fountain, it's down the hall. On my way, I, I run into Joanne. Joanne, oh my gosh, what? I haven't even seen you since school started. How have you been? You see, I didn't get the water. You see me talking to Joanne. I wasn't lying when I said I wanted water, Roy. I was not lying. It was just that I ran into Joanne and started talking to her. This is how we per- hurt people's feelings. If you say you're going to the library, if you say you're getting water, when you run into Joanne, this is how you must manage this. Joanne, give me a second. Let me go get some water. I'll be right back. Or Joanne, go with me. I need to join me. I got to get some water. So at least I see you going to get the water that you said you needed to get. Okay. Yeah. You said I need to go to the library and you run into Joanne on your way and I can see you in my peripheral vision. Then you say, Joanne, I'm, gosh, I'd like to catch up. You want to walk with me down the hall because I need to go to the library. That's, you're still moving towards the library. So it looks like you haven't blown me off. All right, so here's another example. And, and Roy's about to do it to me now, but I want you to all to be aware of this, okay? <laughs> Professionals that do this. Roy's right. gonna say something like this. So I have one last question, Deborah. Or before we leave today, Deborah, I, I, I just wanna say da 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 da, whatever he's gonna, he's letting me know this is almost over. So now I'm, I'm having a conversation, I'm a teenager, and I'm having it with another teenager. And that other teenager just won't stop talking about how great you know her scores were on the AP exams or how he, you know, is so great at baseball and intends to be a professional player or, or it's either bragging or it's boring or I, or you just got to go. The person's fine, but you got to go. This is how you do it. Use what Roy's going to do with me, a white flag. A white flag is what they use in, in car racing. It indicates to the drivers, white flag, one more lap, and then this is over. Well, we're going to do that in conversation. So Roy, let's pretend I needed to go. I would say, Roy, for a show of appreciation, if I can, Roy, this has been a great interview. I've only got a minute left. Is there anything else you'd like to know? Okay, so that would be mine. Now here's a teenager, and they're going on and on about their um, prolific AP prowess. 
gosh, it sounds like you've really done well in AP. I've acknowledged what they've said. I haven't paraphrased it or summarized it. It sounds like you're really great in these AP classes. You know, before I take off, because I've got a, a lot of stuff on my plate today to get done. Before I take off, I just, what would you say your number one ingredient to success is to be, you know, so great at AP classes? Or somebody's going on and on about their vacation, you know, this cruise they got to go on, and they're just describing every detail, and you just, you're bored or you got to go. Hey, it sounds like that cruise was great. Hey, I'm, I'm going to have to take off in, uh, in a minute or two. But, you know, I got to catch up with some other people that are here. But before I go, you know, I'd like to hear what was your favorite thing about that vacation? You've let them know this is almost over. Yeah. Get out of this with dignity, wrap it up. And if they don't wrap it up and they keep babbling, then guess what you get to do? What Roy's about to do to me, turn off the sound. And this is how we do it face to face. We go, like I said, I really got to get going. I got a lot. I got a million things to do. Um, maybe I'll catch up on your vacation another time. You interrupt them and you go. But give people a warning that it's almost over. And most people will hear that and stop. Yeah, good point. That's such a great point. And there's tons of nonverbal cues that you can also add to the verbal. And today we're limited right. to that. And um, so, Deborah. Yes, Roy, that went fast, didn't it? So before we had 30 minutes, just flew by, flew by. How would, you know, for our audience, I've already posted the link to the book. Like if oh, folks wanted you. to get in touch with you um, or find out more about you, where would they go? What's the best way? Um, are you on Twitter? Are you on Facebook, social media, et cetera? Gosh, what if I said no? How old? I know I'm, that you are. Oh, what if, did anybody ever say no to you over those questions? That would I wouldn't be, ask if I didn't already know the oh, answer. Oh, good. Oh, that's see. Now that's another tip in the book. Don't ask a question you don't know the answer to. I love that, Roy. I love that. Like, don't ask some senior in high school, did you get into Northwestern? If you don't know the answer, don't ask that kind of a question. Okay. Folks, thank you. All right. So, yes, I'm on all those. But the best way to find all of that is at DebraFine.com. That's D-E-B-R-A-F-I-N-E.com. It's got Facebook, Instagram, which you failed to ask me about. Maybe you were afraid I'd say no, Roy. But I oh, forgot about Instagram. Instagram. Sorry. Yeah, let's not forget that. Aren't, aren't you on Instagram? Roy? I am. Oh, there you go. So, there you go. But anyways, thanks. DebraFine.com. Thanks for putting that up there, Roy. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks. Thank it's you great so to much. meet you. Great meeting you. Um, it's an honor. Right. Stay in touch. I wish you continued success. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, this sounds a little bad on my end. Oh, thank okay. you, Deborah, and all of you guys who are watching and um, all of you who are watching on the recording. Thank you so much for being with us. That's all for this episode of Today's Teenager. Thanks to our special guest, Deborah Fine. Look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Thank you, Roy. Take care.